And um, is he here? <laughs> Please, go ahead, take the floor. Um, I was promised I could show some pictures. Let's see that, if that works. No, I need a friendly technician. Ah, no. Um, yes, um, thank you very much for, for inviting me, for having me. Um, every conference has a weird paper. My paper is a weird paper. I, I will score for the opposition and an own goal, okay? Um, but bear with me. I've, I've been interested for a long time in questions of intercivilizational encounters. And the problem here is that when you meet someone from a different civilization, the temptation is to treat them as very different from yourself. And then you end up with the Saidian problem of, of Orientalism. You Orientalize the other. The other is always, in every respect, totally different from yourself. However, it seems to me that Said's own solution isn't very convincing either, that is to say, to make everyone into an American, really. I could do it. I'm Edward Said. I became an American. You can do it too. We can all be the same. So somehow you need to deal with this, of, of acknowledging differences and similarities at the same time, and not impose evaluative judgment. Now, I, I th it's differently put, it's a question of whether there could be alternative forms of modernity. Can you be modern, fully modern, 100% modern, but just in a different way? And this is something that Shmuel Eisenstadt and others have, have written about. And this is something I've been trying to think about as well. Um, so, uh, the, the question then is, is, what does it mean to, to meet someone? How do you fully understand each other without forcing someone to be different? I lived in China, working in China for seven years. The Chinese have, for the last 100 years, conducted a civil war on themselves. Ever since the middle of the 19th century, they have decided that we are not good enough because we are not Western. And communism in China was a way to become Western. My fourth movement in China was a way to become Western. And now capitalism is a way to become Western. Everything we are is bad. And we have to change. We have to become different than we are. I think you can see a similar logic, certainly in Japan, also in Turkey. And this is very problematic for, for a country that has to go through this process of kind of constant cultural revolution. So this is an important problem of how to, how to deal with um, inter-civilizational encounters. If you look at this picture, you, you find the best example. Now, this is a picture painted by one of the first fleeters. The first fleeters were the first a group of convict ships that ended up in New South Wales in Australia in 1788. And this is one of the um, um, officers on board. He painted this picture. It shows the first encounter between Englishmen and Aborigines. And what are they doing? They're dancing together. They're holding hands and they're dancing. And it's very sweet. And it's just like sort of children in, on a picnic. And I saw this, and I thought, yes, that's, that's it. That's how, as it should be. This is how culture should meet. Um, it's, they're obviously dancing in the English fashion. You could say it's not, a, it's not an Australian-type dance, so it's, it's done on, the English, on English terms. They're inviting the locals, but they're clearly enjoying themselves. They're having a good time. This is 1788. And then I became interested in, in questions of um, how, how we live in the world. What, what does it mean to exist as an individual, as a society? Big kind of philosophical question, Heideggerian and all this. Um, but what's interesting is I came across a number of people, co contemporary philosophers, who have written on questions of embodiment. And this is someone like um, 
Alva Noé, Sean Gallagher, um, Mark Johnson. Exceptional works on this. It, it's related to neuroscience, it's related to phenomenology. But the point anyway is that it's, it's, you can think of it as a critique of constructivism. Now, in the social sciences the last 30 years or so, 50 years or so, everything's been an issue of constructivism, the socially constructed. And, and this, this is fine. I mean, I used to be a social constructivist before. Anyway, uh, no, but, but it's too cognitive, that's the problem. It's too much in your head. It's about interpretation. And culture is always about interpretation. And when you go around the world, you have this little kind of rule book, and you look things up, which doesn't mean, oh, let me see page something. And ah, oh, now I understand, now I interpret. But this phenomenological tradition says, no, 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 it doesn't work like that at all. Any, any interpretation that you come up with happens late, like end of the day. Everything before that is about your body and the world. And in fact, of course, there's no distinction between the two. Your body and your mind are the same. It's not that we have bodies, we are bodies. And, and this is a, a system that interacts with the world. So th this, th it's a mistake to reduce us to this rationalistic function. And if you look at these bodies, wh why are they c communicating so well? Because they can't talk. They have no language in which to talk together. They don't share a language. Um, they are interacting with their bodies. And if you look at similar cases of first encounters, like for example, Charles Darwin, when he goes to Tierra del Fuego in South America, he's doing the same thing. He, he doesn't know how to talk to these people. They don't know how to talk to him, but they're kind of slapping each other around a bit. And then says, says Darwin, we started waltzing. And they're all waltzing together. So there's something very endearing and wonderful about this. So, the question that for me became, um, why are they dancing? What a strange thing to do. And the whole topic of dance is embarrassing, right? I, I find it embarrassing to talk about it now, because if you talk about this, you're not taken seriously. What is this strange thing? But the reason why we consider it strange and a bit embarrassing and a bit gay, OK, to truth be told, um, is that something has happened is a radical transformation in the way we are in the world, the way we exist in the world. We exist in the world as rational beings. In early modern Europe, they did not. And this is interesting to me because of what it says about the West, but it's also interesting to me because it says something about our relations with the non-Western world. So I, who is this? Louis XIV. Now, Louis XIV, participated from the age of 12 to the age of 32 in 80 different balletic performances. He was dancing all the time. He was the Sun King, and you can tell, right? He looks like the Sun King. Now, he wasn't gay, and he wasn't strange. His father did the same thing. In fact, every single um, prince or ruler in or in the Baroque again, um, in, in the Baroque era, danced. The Swedish kings did, the Swedish queen did, the queen of England, all over Germany, they're dancing all the time. So why are they doing this? Well, long story basically, it has to do with what I call onto ontological purpose. You make a world through your dance. You're creating a world through your dance. And you show this world to your courtiers, above all, and also to other invited people. This is the world that I have created, and this is a world where I rule. The um, people on the ship going to Australia, they knew how to dance because they were professional dancers. Like sailors, they, had, they, they danced something called the hornpipe, Scottish hornpipe, or sailor's hornpipe which was what they did. Uh, James Scott, uh, James um, Cook writes about this. Every morning, they would go up and dance on deck. Uh, this was not just sailors. Other professions had the same um, uh, traditions. Like uh, lawyers in, in the Inn of Court in London, they would dance all the time, putting on their black clothes and coats and then wigs, and they would dance together. 
This is simply what you did. So th this very elaborate language of, of embodiment, of dance, at this, uh, during this period, and this is the language that they take with them when they go and explore the world. So it's very natural. It's a very natural way to behave and a very natural way to relate to others. It's very interesting, for example, when Europeans come to China in the 17th century, they see these um, Chinese very elaborate court ceremonies, and they have no problems understanding that at all. They say, of course, that's what we do too. Obviously, they go even like a place like Dahomey, now, Dahomey in, in Africa. We think, oh, well, Europeans have always been very dismissive of, of African culture. No, they went to Dahomey and they were extremely impressed with the way the king danced. The king of Dahomey was dancing. And the Europeans say, of course, we know about that. We do that too, of course. His ontological, creating a world and making himself, through. yeah, 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 we do all that too. Or they would go, for example, to Latin America, the Americas, and they would see religious ceremonies of the Aztecs. And these ceremonies, they would dance with the, like the flayed bodies of, of the enemies, or they would cut off the, the legs and, and arms of the enemies and wave them around and dance. So it's horrible, right? It's very gruesome. But at the same time, it is something that the Europeans can relate to very strangely. Like there's a, um, a conquistador, no, he's, he's a friar, I guess a Jesuit, uh, called Ribas. And he says, yeah, they are expressing a religious sentiment through their dance that we can understand because we, have all, we are also expressing our religious sentiments through dance. And this means that we have a commonality. Oh yeah, this is James Cook in Tahiti. Um, oh, sorry, let me see. No. Yeah, th this is more uh, early modern Baroque uh, court dancing, king's dancing. So the the point then is that something happens in the 19th century, which basically robs us Europeans of our bodies and emphasizes our rational faculties, making it more difficult for us to understand ourselves and also more difficult for us to understand others. So that when we, want, it's very obvious to look, for example, at, at court ballets. Court ballets become romantic ballets in the beginning of the 19th century. They turned into pretty girls in tutus doing uh, on point work, right, on tippy toe. Um, it becomes very something for eff effeminate men to do, or for gays to do. It becomes embarrassing for the rest of us. Tough guys don't dance. Um, and we lose this ability to, to think about ourselves and to relate to others in, in these embodied terms. Instead, dance becomes either of two things. It becomes a performance, like in a the theatrical performance, to go to see a show and people are dancing in front of you, or if you're participating yourself, it's a way to take time off from your rational pursuits and to just relax. So if, under both descriptions, to dance is irrelevant, really. It's something you do to entertain yourself watching it, or you do it to, to, to get some time off um, when, when you dance with others. So, so Dance becomes something that we don't uh, no longer understand. We don't know why we're doing it. It has no purpose, no ontological, no epistemological purpose. And for that reason, we also find it more difficult to understand people in other parts of the world. Um, we, well, if, if you look at anthropologists, they always talk about, you know, why are the natives dancing? Well, it's, 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 a, it's a ritual, it's magic, right? And they're standing outside and they're looking at this magic happening and it's, it's a performance. So who are dancing? Well, the Europeans continue dancing, or the aristocrats do, 
Uh, this is the Congress of Vienna, 1815, when all the uh, diplomats are dancing together. Here, we're not, no longer dancing with strangers, we're dancing with people who are like ourselves. The Europeans are dancing with each other. And this aristocratic culture is transformed into the civilizational culture of, of Europe. This is what it means to be civilized. We can dance together, we can be together because we're all the same. And they, they do this, the aristocrats in 1815, they're waltzing. And it's very interesting what happens when, when if you're an outsider, if you're African, forget it, no chance. You can't, you can't join the dance, you know? You're, you're too weird. You dance in a mystical, uh, ritual fashion. We don't want that. What to do about uh, people like Turks? 1815 in Paris, they're invited to, to the Paris Conference after the Crimean War. What do the Turks do? I was reading about this, very kind of, uh, you know, excitedly trying to find out, did they dance or did they not dance? Of course they danced. They were dancing all the time because that's how you become one of, of the group. What about Japan? Japan in 1882 built a place in Tokyo called um, the Rokumeikan. And the Rokumeikan was a dance hall where um, the emperor would stage balls and Japanese people could come and learn how to dance and learn the practices of European diplomacy. And Europeans who were visiting Japan could go there and dance as well. And this was a way to prepare yourself for being a member of the international society. This is um, Ulysses Grant visiting Japan. And I, I, don't, I should know the year. I don't. Quite striking, it seems to me. OK, thank you very much. Thank you for a very interesting and uh, remarkable presentation. <laughs> I learned something. Dancing all the time as a motto over centuries among different cultures, dancing with each other. You don't need language, you need just the body. Body language, maybe. And you create a world of your own. This was an interesting uh, um, um, a phrase you mentioned. The question is only, can dance be an antidote antidote to barbarism? Or is maybe sometimes barbarism connected with dancing? Yeah? And what happens, for example, with our mass cultures of the Rolling Stones, the Rammsteins, and so forth? Is it the democratization of dancing, which has reached the masses and the people now? And it's not anymore a kind of an elusive, higher up uh, and, and, and gymnastics, or whatever you may call it. OK, wonderful. Yeah.